tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is author Thomas Farber and photographer Matthew Horton. These are Matthew's photographs on the set today. Author Thomas Farber was born and raised in Boston. His father was a famous pathologist, his mother a poet and singer. He may have been following his brainy father at Yale Law School, but he dropped out, and it seems that you followed your mother's artistic course. I did, but uh, over her objections. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, I think she well knew what a life in the arts uh, is like, that it can be uh, a life of jeopardy. And I think uh, she, you had to really want it to convince her. But know? it seems to me that it would be as hard, a, difficult a life as a doctor that your father was in. I mean, he was, yeah. must have been away a lot. No, uh, he traveled some, but uh, he loved his work. So I think uh, you know that that path was clear. Uh, but uh, my mother uh, had been a singer, a leader, and and, uh, and uh, she uh, wrote many books uh, of poetry and many books for children. So uh. um, she knew the hazards of that life. Yeah. But did she encourage you once you came to California? Well, she, she gave us, you know, uh, her gift of language. So, you know, I, I really do speak my mother tongue. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. and... Uh, I didn't realize it at yeah. the time I was going to ask you these things, but it seemed like here you were from these two people and that, whoop, to the mother's side. Well, my, my father, would, would he would protest if he were alive. He would say, hey, I was pretty good with words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he was, yeah. You came to California in the 60s. Yes. Um, were there similarities uh, to what was going on here in the East Coast and, and well, in California? Uh, I was uh, in Northern California, you know, really when, uh, uh, just before the uh, free speech movement and then uh, with the whole kind of anti-war movement. And so these were, you know, these were crazy times for everyone. And uh, But it, do you think more so in Calif on the oh, yeah, West Coast than on sure. the East Coast? Yeah, I think we did it first here. You did it for yeah, you. We came all did. And did it here. Yeah, and uh, but those were very intense times, and that my first book comes out of uh, journalism uh, I did for an underground paper in the '60s in San Francisco. That's what I was going to ask you when you first got published. Uh, I had the great good fortune to uh, meet uh, Marvin Garson, who was then the editor of a new paper, the San Francisco Express Times, and uh, he encouraged me to write for him, and uh, I did, and uh, I kept writing. But those were newspaper articles, right? They Not were kind of books. new journalism. They were first person, but very freewheeling. Uh -huh. He didn't. Uh, we didn't have to be responsible. Something we, that hadn't been taking place yet. That's right. Uh, it was new, and it, it, it was very like fiction. It had a lot of freedom. Uh, it was nonfiction, but it was it was pretty freewheeling. And then were were those. Um, those articles, like the lead-in to your... Yeah, an editor your... in New York saw, saw those pieces, and uh, she asked me if I would do a book, kind of pulling them together and amplifying them, and I did. Oh, so you used those yeah. as your first book. Yeah, they became the, the basis for it, yeah. That's and, great. And once that door was open, uh, then mm -hmm. I realized, you know, how much I wanted to pursue that. You, um, you were on national public radio. I was, on All Things Considered, yeah. Did, were you one of the first? I don't know. When, during uh, that, how long has that show been on? It's it's, been on well, I did it uh, back in uh, the early 80s, so it's a long time ago. It, uh -huh. But it was a lot of fun. Uh, I would tell uh, one three-minute story a week. So you wrote your own? Oh, or yeah. You've, you researched yeah. your own thing? I, I did my own stories. It could be about anything, something responding to the larger world or something a neighbor had just done. And, and where did you do them? I taped them up at uh, uh, KQED. In San Francisco, and then you s and then they they, they would fed they would them send in. them, and you had to get them perfect. Uh, <laughs> perfect otherwise, you had to <laughs> yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you had to start again. It was a different technology. Exactly. And but I love signing off because I lived in Berkeley. The uh, my sign off when I taped them was, and this is Tom Farber in San Francisco. 
Oh, because, <laughs> <laughs> because that's where the studio was. So it was a lot of fun. Well, talking about San Francisco, we're, we're at the bay, yes. talking about water. How does Hawaii fit into your oh, life of riding? Uh, it's, water is one of my obsessions, particularly warm water. And I spent a lot of the uh, 80s and 90s very intensely in Hawaii and uh, uh, a lot Actually of time. Actually living there? Yeah, and a lot of time surfing. I taught at the university. I was a Fulbright fellow down in Fiji. So I oh. really uh, pursued that part of my life intensely. Because yeah. you got an NEA? Well, the NEAs were for fiction. Uh, but, but it wasn't for what, it, what was this, the Fulbright? The, the Fulbright was to go down and spend time uh, seeing the South Pacific and meeting post-colonial South Pacific Island writers. Is that right? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Very interesting. Yeah, and these are, many of them were people I knew in Hawaii because they came up to Hawaii, uh, you know, as part of the Pacific. But uh, I- The I big city, going to the big city. Or the imperial, <laughs> the seat of imperial power. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I, I wanted to see the world they came from and also to meet writers that I hadn't met down there and then to write about their work. And at this time, um, did you write that, the novel On Water? Uh, my, my two, my two yes. nonfiction water books. Oh, uh, nonfiction, on, yeah, sorry. Uh, on Water and uh, the, face. the Face of the Deep uh, were done in the 90s, as well as my two collaborations with the great marine photographer, Wayne Levin, uh, uh, his black and white in the water photography. So there was a long period where my art was water. You, you were in the water oh, with Wayne, working sure. with your yeah. photographer. Yeah, he's a, a, a fine artist. Our second book just came out from the University of Hawaii Press. It's called Other Oceans, and it's oh. our study and our, our consideration of uh, open ocean and aquariums. Would you write and then he would photograph what you'd written or did no, you I, look at what he was doing? I would just accompany him and, and learn what he was doing and then try to, to do something that spoke to both of our concerns. Yeah. You, you also, teaching at UC Berkeley, have mentored a lot of writers. Some, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's pretty fun. like. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun teaching and uh, it, Cal is a great school if I may say so, down here in LA. In SC territory. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, the University of California at Berkeley is a wonderful place, and uh, we have some fine writers in the department, and, uh, you know, there's just, it's a wonderful place. Have you gone on to see your, someone that you've worked with actually get published and? Oh, sure, yeah, and uh, it like takes Like had a child <laughs> that yeah, way, in a way? A, yeah, it's a certain kind of uh, uh, intense hunger that you can't give someone but you can help them if they do have that hunger. And you have to notice that. You have yeah. to recognize that. Is that the yeah, point? And they, yeah. You have to notice it and you have to keep them going. If you can, encourage them and, and give them discipline. But also they have to have this ferocious drive. To become a writer, you just have to want it very badly. That's kind of what separates people out. Yeah, most, mo more than any other variable, I think, is that need. And you kind of, I think, were aware of it from the very beginning if you say that your parents actually said yeah. that this is a tough life. Oh yeah, they, they, they uh, and also I, I saw my mother working on things. When my mother uh. would be rehearsing a part uh, for a play or something like that, you know, I'd see how much work went into it or when she was preparing for a concert. So I was raised knowing what the arts took. But you, but she in essence was working with a lot of people, even though she was alone and rehearsing. You work alone. I do. And you don't yeah. have any actual Feedback from your audience. No, uh, Joseph Con <laughs> Joseph Conrad said. Uh, Joseph Conrad said, uh, you know, uh, there are no policemen in the uh, world of the writer when the writer is, is working. So how does the writer know if he's led himself astray? It's a long haul. A and then book. actually, once yeah. you've written it, you have to depend on two or three critics. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's a bad fate, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is actually. It's funny, actually. Uh, uh, my character in in this novel says uh, he imagines a bumper sticker that says, "Writers are always submitting." <laughs> That's right. The, but let's talk about that novel, The Beholder, yes. which is something uh, in itself uh, breaking ground because as an artist, which a writer is, uh, or, or a fine artist, let's, let's start with a fine artist who uses a model or uses uh, something, this photographer saw these cars and he photographed it. Yes. Um, a writer doesn't usually do that. But doesn't in have this, figure models. In no. this situation, yeah. you... My character, <laughs> my character is, has decided that, that there's no reason why, given his interest in the female form, that uh, painters and photographers should be the only ones to work with models. So the, as the novel opens, uh, my protagonist, who's a writer, is uh, working with figure models. 
And, and you talk about this as being models, sex, and death novel. It is. It so, is. So, so go but, on and tell us with those things in mind. But I, I'd add the word love. The, oh, and love. <laughs> <yeah>. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, so the, the, there are two characters, the writer uh, who's 49 and a young woman who we gather is in her mid-20s, and she's an art historian. She's just finished her PhD, so she, and she knows a lot about art. This is her field. So they meet, and what happens between them is, is a, a very passionate affair, but also uh, love. And what happens is that they also start creating an art between them, not just uh, a verbal art, but actually a photographic art. Uh, they take pictures. Oh, they do movies. They don't take they pictures. They take of, pictures. Yes, um, but also, um, death. Death is never very far away from the passion in this novel, um, both because the writer has come close to death, even though he's only forty-nine, but also because she's married. And so that the passion they share is constantly threatened by an ending. And uh, people joke about the phrase, you know, uh, uh, a Woody Allen kind of phrase, sex and death. But maybe they really are talking about passion and loss. And that's something, of course, we all, we all know something about. So just before we leave, you had to find a model. How did you find models to come models? in? Well, you were riding, actually, right? You uh, were riding did, yeah. and you had a live model there. Well, I, I originally thought it would be a nonfiction book about this whole conversation about the female form in paintings and and so I put an ad in the paper um, in a local paper and uh, I got many many responses. Uh, do you think that was a naive thing to do? I thought it was uh, transgressive. <laughs> transgressive, the word, <laughs> right? Is, transgressive. Yeah. <laughs> but it also it also amused me and of course as soon as I started working with the models uh, they're real people and uh, and in a way they pushed me onto my novel because I realized that I was I was looking for some extraordinary person in the form of the models. I wanted a muse. So were you, exactly, yes. you were actually interacting as the writer. You were looking for something sure. aside from the character you were writing about. Oh, sure. That's what I was yeah. thinking, too. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Well, how did that work out? It worked I mean, out they were <laughs> Female nudes, you didn't fall in love with one of your models, did you? No, but, uh, but what they helped me do was identify the hunger, and the hunger was to write a story of, of great passion and great threat of loss around the female nude, in which the muse, the young woman, would be at least the equal of the artist. So that, that all the questions about who's in charge and that kind of interaction would be resolved. These are two people who are equally at risk and equally uh, passionate about what's going on between them. So, the, one of the one of the um, things about the book is it said you were painting with your words. Yes. Did you were you aware of that? Oh, or is that fair to say? Uh, I don't mind that as a description. The um, it's it's harder to do in words what a painter does with paint. I would think Le so. <laughs> uh, Leonardo da Vinci said this that in describing the female form, it would be very hard to do in words because the human figure is so quicksilver; it moves so quickly. Mm. But I had fun trying. Oh, I had and, a lot I, of fun and trying. I started reading this, and I was like, I, I have to finish this before I talk to Tom. But yeah. I, I haven't finished it. Um, but well, I will. Be careful. It may be too risque. That's what, <laughs> That's what I was worried about. Tom Farber, thank you for coming down from up north and being with us today. Thank you, John. And The Beholder is his novel. And don't go away because we'll be right back with Matthew Horton, our photographer of the day. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with photographer Matthew Horton, who lives in Hollywood and shows at the Hetty Corsen Gallery in West Hollywood. Matthew was born in Berlin, went to boarding school in England, and spent uh, some of his young childhood with his parents back and forth from Italy to Spain. But at 15, he went on to study music in New York and London. How long did you stay in New York? And how at 15 did you leave home? Oh, um, that's rather a long story, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I left, I, I got to Hollywood at 17. 
get to and Hollywood. No, sorry, New York. That's okay, right. New, New York, York is 17. Uh, and I was there a couple of years. That's a little better. That 15 was, is pretty young. Yeah, but I was all on my own. I, you know, had to, I arrived and had to get an apartment and... And you studied piano? Yes. Yeah, I had a huge Steinway in my apartment, which, you know, in New York, and I'd play it at all days of, times of day and night. And, and where'd you go to study? Um, I was studying with uh, one of the top teachers at the Juilliard. Oh, you were at Juilliard? Yeah. So you had applied and were accepted and went to school and did yeah. all the right, proper things? Yeah. Oh, and why didn't you become a uh, pianist? Um, well, I concentrated more on, on composing and uh, uh, things like that at that time. Do you still do that? A little bit, yeah. Um, at the, uh, I wrote a pop song for somebody, actually, at the time when I was uh, still a music student, uh, which did quite well. It was quite a funny story because I just gave him the music and then I left and I didn't really think much more about it. And a couple of years later, I was, uh, actually it was more than a couple of years later, I was sitting in a bar in Athens and I suddenly heard this music blaring across the system. I thought, oh my God, I, I know that music. That's mine. Are you kidding? Yeah. Anyway. And yeah. who was that? He was called Klaus Nomi. He was like a hip figure, a Studio 54. I remember yeah. the name. Is that right? So yeah. here you are. What were you doing in Greece? Oh, I <laughs> went to Greece. <laughs> we're like going along your life here. Yeah, I went to Greece originally as a journalist. Um, mm. And then I gave up journalist and I moved to an, a Greek island uh, where I spent a number of years writing and reading. So you did stay in Greece a long time. Did you learn how to speak Greek? Oh, yes, I learned how to speak Greek. You had to, I guess, huh, on a small island? Yes, well, I mean, the, you know, the, the goats were Greek, so, I mean, you know. <laughs> you had to talk to somebody. I had to talk to someone. <laughs> and you couldn't speak in Italian. Uh, well, I could speak Italian, but the, the, they didn't understand Italian very much. No, so from yeah. Greece, you went to Tuscany. Yes. And did yeah. you stay in Tuscany? I stayed there a while. I mean, I actually spent a lot of my childhood in Tuscany. Oh, so it was yeah. familiar ground to you? Yeah, my parents have a, a vineyard there, and so and a farm. So I spent uh, many happy years ah. <laughs> amongst the vines. Or yeah. talking to the cows in Greek, did they understand that? No, I talked to Italian ta cows oh. in Italian, oh, yeah, I and the Greek sheep in Greek. Were you taking yeah. photographs then? Uh, not much. I, I bought my first camera uh, in Texas when I was 17. And was what just were you before. doing there? Um, when I got shipped off, I was rather a kind of, I think I was considered to be a troublesome child. So uh. originally my parents <laughs> didn't really know what to do with me. I see. So I, I was shipped off to Texas uh, at, um, to kind of, you know, uh, I, I think they thought that might toughen me up. You Were know? you living there? Yeah, I lived there. Oh, for, you lived there? Yeah, for about six months. Oh, so you got your camera. Yeah, I bought What a, kind of camera? I bought an Nikon. It was, oh, a good yeah, camera. Yeah, and no, I bought a, my first good camera there and started taking photographs. Well, that was very yeah. good. Now let's get back to where were we? Tuscany. In the 90s, you were riding. I guess we're past Tuscany now. In the, in the 90s, uh, you were riding again. Yeah. Um, what uh, were you riding? I was riding horses. Horses, not yes. riding. Not right. No, I did both. I you did writing, writing and riding. You were riding, yeah. actually, in the yeah. 90s, a screenplay or something like yes. that. Yes, I came, I came to Hollywood. That was much later. Uh, I, I did have a career as a, as a professional rider. Okay, we of missed horses. that. You New missed Zealand, that one out. New Zealand, yes. in between. Yeah. Okay, what happened? Why were you doing horses? I, I always wanted to. When I was a, a boy, I, the, my heroes were people like Beethoven and Liszt and Lucinda Pryor Palmer, who was a, oh, was a show say, jumper. Was Liszt a horse person? <laughs> no, it was either composers <laughs> or horse people. And uh, you know, whilst all the, my school friends had uh, movie stars up on their on their walls, I had um, Beethoven. I had Beethoven and uh, a sexy girl in riding breeches. Oh, how you know? great! Anyway, that was great. Yeah. Oh, so then then you came to Hollywood? Yes, I mean, I, 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 I'd always wanted to be, uh, an, I knew I was always an artist, I wanted to be a writer, and so, um, but I took some time off to do some other interesting things, like travel the world and, you know, compete in, with the horses. Oh, you did take the horses yeah. around. Yeah. But once you finished with the horses, you were, you, you wrote for theater, you wrote a movie, you, yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, when do we get to photography? Uh, yes, I know. I was wondering when we were going to get to that. Yeah. Um, yes, I came out here to do a movie for Columbia, uh, Columbia TriStar. I wrote a movie for them. 
And then I put a play on here, which I wrote and directed. See? Yes. <laughs> and were you photographing all the while? Uh, not always. I see. Okay. I, I, I took it, I really kind of started again. I started doing, actually, I shot the publicity, publicity shot. That's what I wondered, yeah. For my play. Did you? Yeah, yeah, which is now going to New York. Well, now we're into your right. current career. That's current right. Current career. Yes. Joe? Cadillacs. But, Cadillacs. Uh, these careers all take place concurrently, though. You know. Oh, so we're, yeah. so you're not so old. Is that what we're trying yeah. to do? <laughs> well, I do them all at the same time. Okay. So, yeah, Cadillacs. Did you study photography? No, I never studied it. So it's just this innate eye. Yes. Do you do, you do the cropping yourself? I mean, when you go, do you go into the uh, uh, lab? Yeah. Um, I, I didn't print this myself. I've printed a lot of, I do print myself. This is a full frame. You can see this is actually... You can see the sprockets here at the 35 millimeter. But how did you learn how to uh, how did you learn how to print if you didn't study any of this? <coughs> I, did, I, did. I think somebody showed me uh, when I was, um, you know, uh, in New York. Really? Yes. And then, and then you start. Yeah. So when you when you take a photograph, do you tell a story? My, I mean, my, I like my photographs to be aesthetic. And that's their main purpose, uh, and to do some good. Uh, it's, you know, I like to think of it as writing with light. Um, I, you know, I tend to use natural light. Um, that's what I was going to ask yeah. you because we have this. Obviously, is natural light. E yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is outside. Yeah, this is a piece of Americana. I mean, I, I, I just like that. I think it's a fun piece. Um, it's one of my smaller pieces because some of the bigger ones we wouldn't be able to fit in here. I mean, I've already cluttered up your studio, Joe, oh, with so pictures, <laughs> but the, it's, I, I love the, the, the size of this, you know, um, it, it makes an impact. That, what, you, you, know. you said you always wanted to be an artist, what distinguishes mm. an art photographer from just photography? Well, I think you're, you're heading for a different market, you've got greater liberties. Um, As I mean, an if, art photographer? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you're shooting for a fashion catalogue and you turn in mm, something like this, uh, you're not really kind of showing off the product that you're trying to sell. Uh -huh. I guess my product is aesthetics rather than, you know. So uh, rather than just a, a regular a, commercial photographer. Yeah, a, sp a specific piece of clothing or something. Um, but, you know, in the fashion industry, they like creative photographers, so they often take fine art photographers mm -hmm. and use their skills to create, you know, beautiful fashion images. Well, so how would you describe your type of photography? Um, Besides I, painting with light, I like yeah, that. I just painting with light. I mean, you know, I take an interest in all sorts of things. I like I like photographing people, um, landscapes. You know, I've done some nudes, uh, like this one down here. Um, and, and let's let's talk about yeah. natural light versus right. rigging lights because. Um, let's yeah. see if I can hold this up. Okay, this is that. a picture I took of you in your home, um, where the lighting was actually very bad. It's very uh, dark. It's very dark, and I wanted to capture that. I didn't bring any uh, strobes with me, so it was kind of a challenge. It was quite a challenge, Jen. How did you get the light on my face? <coughs> I mean, it looks like you have a light just shining right on me. Well, I used the front door, if you remember. I opened the front door and let in the natural light that way. And, and would uh, you do that um, in, what else do we have here, like this nude? Yeah, that I shot in a studio, but with natural light. I, I had to, um, I had to organize the sunlight. Actually, block it off. I was mainly taking light out of the picture uh, to get that effect. So, how is is it a black background? Yeah. Oh, my knee is in the way. <laughs> I can't get my knee out of the way. Um, so it's a black background, and the nude is like, is it more distinguishable, or do you? How do you get this fluidy kind of feel? It's quite a trick, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the textures in this photograph are, are really beautiful. I mean, that's one of the things I like about it so much. It's printed on silver gelatin. Uh, uh, it's a silver gelatin print, so it's very rich. Um, when you see the actual <coughs> picture, um, it's got some texture to it. So is that, I mean, do you choose what to print it on, what paper to print it on? Yeah. How the depth of bl black and white works? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I love the rich <laughs> so blacks. So do this. So, yeah. This is great, this portrait of me. <laughs> because you shot me in my house with right. no light. Right. Then you took me to your studio, which had no light either. <laughs> and I thought the idea was to show how you could shoot in the studio and how you could shoot right. um, 
in a person's environment. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I love this <laughs> portrait of you, Jane. I, uh, you look like a princess <laughs> there. But how did you do it? You had yeah. natural, you opened a door again. Yeah, I opened a door and um, I just used the, the natural light. I'm, I, you know, I, I <laughs> measure it and then expose and the you, film. And, and you get this color like on the side of me? I mean, the light on one side? Yeah, I think it creates kind of dramatic effect. Uh, you know, I, 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 one of my intentions with these kind of portraits, and this too, is and to... And this, Luca. Yeah. He looks so fabulous. His hand looks beautiful. And he still has the light on just one side of his face yeah. as well. I don't always do that, I have to say. But these, I, you know, I wanted to create something that was like the Renaissance portraits. That's just how they yeah. look. They're just beautiful. Yeah. Um, you know, I love the way the jewelry's come out in your picture. And, you know, your eyes are shining. And it, it's, uh, it is, it's formal, but, you know, at the same time, there's character in it. And, and it's very beautiful. How do you choose to sit a person? How do you know? I mean, you can't put everybody in this pose or in Luca's pose, right? No, I think I, I tend to leave that up to the sitter. Uh, you know, I work with them. I'm there. You know, we, we're usually chatting away as we're during the photo session. And so, then, you, and yeah. then do you put them in a certain position? Or do you say, I need you here because I can get some light there? Yeah, I'm not very autocratic about it. But <laughs> <laughs> as long as they're in the light, you know, I, that's really what I'm looking for. That the light's right and, you know, that they're not obscuring themselves. You're um, off to South Africa. Is there a lot of light there? Would you, will your pictures look different there when you go to shoot? I don't know, I've never been there. Oh, so you <laughs> don't know. So I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm just off on an adventure. Uh, ah. I've been to West Africa. The light was fantastic uh -huh. there. Um, but uh, I don't know about South Africa, so that'll be an adventure. So what happens when you get there? I'll just have to figure it out when I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just take all my equipment, and I can usually, you know, handle any situation that comes up. You um, photograph fashion people, yeah. Yeah. art, art subjects, and um, what is your favorite? I like. I think I like people most of all. You know, portraiture. Yeah, portraiture. I like landscape store. We don't have any here. This is a bit of Americana. This is yeah. Uh, I, I, that's I just find an amusing picture. You know, I, I like the size of it. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the nudes, I've done a whole series of those. They're very aesthetic. You know, they're not titillating or cheap in any way. Um, and that they really kind of uh, glorify the human form, I suppose. I love uh, it. Yeah. I love it. I love yeah. having you here today, Matthew. Well, I love being here, Joan. Thank you so much. Well, thank you and for having thank me. And thank you all for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, 917. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, darling. <laughs>